Shabbat Shalom. A beautiful time of worship. Hallelujah. Of praise. I see we have uh, our missionary from San Diego. Eric. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. That is good. Hallelujah. I don't know how you do these uh, digital, <laughs> Rochelle. All I know is uh, what I'm looking for is Lebanon. Well, Lebanon. Lebanon. <laughs> it will be Israel. It will have a new name. Oh, Lebanon. Oh, I, I was able to access that. Believe me. Well, you were lost. You needed to go to Israel. Hallelujah. <laughs> be careful. Take a right. Be careful what you wish for. She was, just all, saying, she was just asking for a ticket this morning. We all, we all have a destiny to fulfill. <laughs> we all have a um, a purpose for which God has called us, has ordained us. Many people ask, "How do you know God called you to preach?" Well, <laughs> just just try not preaching. <laughs> you can't run from the call of God. Amen. Amen. There are dates in our life that are very important. like February the 9th, 1971. Oh, that is a blessed. Oh. It was the day that I was reborn. Because oh, Jesus said, unless a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of. And when I pause like that, that's responsive. Heaven. 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 You cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless a man be born again. And of course, you when you're explaining that to a Jewish rabbi like, was it Maimonides? Yes. No, not Maimonides. He was Rambam. the Spanish rabbi. Rambam? Rambam. Well, the Rambam. That's Maimonides. That's Maimonides. But Jesus wasn't speaking those words to Maimonides, to oh, the Rambam. Sure. <laughs> it was somebody that snuck in the middle of the night because he didn't want to be seen <laughs> collaborating with Jesus. Nick at night. Nick at night. Nick at night. Nick at night. It was Nicholas. Nicodemus. He was a Greek. Wasn't he a Sephardi Jew? No. He was a uh, You were either a Hebrew or you were the other camp. The um, the Hezek, no, no, Hellenistic. 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 Was Saint Nick? <laughs> <Whoa. laughs> Was Saint Nick a Hellenistic Jew? Well, anyway, he wanted to know, and inquiring minds want to know, right? Mm -hmm. And if you want to know anything about the kingdom of God, go to the one who knows. And that is Jesus. Hallelujah. Yeshua knows. Because Yeshua has been from everlasting to everlasting. Past, present, future. We worship God. We worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. And we look for the coming of the Moshiach. His name is Yeshua. And I get excited. Anytime I, I want to sit and converse with the Lord, how many know that he knocks on the door? And you have a choice, don't you? You can open the door, and what Yeshua says that he will come in, he will sit with you, and he will what? What would he do? Can you sit down and talk. actually have a chat talk. with Jesus? He said, talk. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. he said, I'll suck with you. 
Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. He's knocking on the door of Lady Sayer right now. Jesus is knocking on the door of the church right now because the church is lukewarm. And a lukewarm church is not a church that glorifies the Lord. He says, there goes Pastor Gilligan getting the Zionist and getting pro-Israel. He's going to talk about Lebanon and he's going to talk about the Middle East and he's going to talk. Can't we just get our eyes off the Middle East? No. Can't we just <laughs> pretend like we don't have a problem over there? <sighs> Many years ago, when I was just a young lad of 16 years old, now here's a testimony. And my mama's right here. <laughs> and my mama has been with me as an eyewitness. You brought his witness. <laughs> right. And I don't know if I drowned this or whatever, but I was born on the 15th of August yeah. in 1958. Yeah, I remember that day. My mom was there and grew up, wasn't it? And I was, I was born on a Friday afternoon. And my mama said, hurry up, I got to give birth to this beloved son. <laughs> Get him out! So he can keep the first Shabbat. <laughs> that may have been a dream. <laughs> but isn't it amazing to be born right there mm -hmm. <clears throat> on the eve of Shabbat mm -hmm. when all of Israel is doing what? Getting ready for the Sabbath. Sabbath candles, Sabbath meals, mm -hmm. um, the Shema, all that goes on on a Friday evening. They shut down the whole place, don't they? Everything like the whole shuts season, down. The, 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 yeah, the, the religious season. Jews. I like that. If there are religious Jews, there are also non-religious Jews. Mm -hmm. So which Jews did Jesus come to save? The, the religious non, ones? The non, well all, but the non. All Jews. And oh. Paul said, all of Israel will be saved. Hallelujah. <laughs> So even those who are not religious right now, one day they will be, when that veil of blindness is removed from their, from their eyes. And when their heart is circumcised. Now, how does God know where the Jews are? Hmm. My mother's a Jew. And she was giving birth to her firstborn son. And of course, in the Torah, it says that the firstborn is holy to God. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And while I was still, <laughs> when I was still in my mother's womb, my mother testified. Because she told me this story. She had um, a prophetic word that she was not carrying just any child. She didn't get that with my brother. <laughs> of course, he's not the firstborn. But there was something unique about when you carried me. My mom can tell you that story. But from the day that I was born, the enemy has been after me. A German shepherd attacked me when I was an infant. I remember that. And my mother dove in front of me, and she took the bite. Now, why a German shepherd? Why wasn't it an Australian shepherd? An Irish shepherd? An English shepherd? But a German shepherd. Lebanese shepherd. <laughs> It was a German woman who owned that dog <laughs> wow. and said, you know what? He's such a nice dog. Oh. Really? Yeah, that's what she told me. That's what she told my mother. Yeah. You've got nothing to worry about. <laughs> yeah. And when the devil entered that dog, he went after to devour me. But my mother threw herself over me 
in defense. Amen. That's the love of a mother. Amen. She's Amen. willing to sacrifice her life to save mine. Jesus said, no greater love has a man but this, but that he laid down his life for his friends. And then Israel, we are friends of Israel. We stand with Israel. We Amen. stand with the Jewish people. And we're not ashamed to testify Amen. Amen. that we are pro-Israel, that we are pro-Zionist, and that we do not believe in a replacement theology. Amen. We do not believe that the Christian church replaced the nation of Israel as God's chosen people. Amen. As it was then, so it is now. Until the coming of the Moshiach, Israel will suffer the trouble that she suffers. So, what role does Lebanon play? I don't believe in reincarnation. I don't. Many of my Jewish rabbis do believe that we keep coming back again and again what? until we get it right. Really? It's embedded in Judaism. Hmm. You pray that you don't come back <laughs> as something other than a human being. It just depends on how you've lived your life according to Jewish tradition. But let me tell you something. There was, 30 days before my birth, there was an invasion in Lebanon. The United States of America, by order of then-President Dwight David Eisenhower, ordered the invasion of Lebanon. Now, why did the United States invade Lebanon on July 15, 1958? Not for the cedars? Hmm? Not for the cedars? It wasn't for the cedars. <laughs> we were in the midst of a Cold War, and I honor those Cold War veterans because after World War II, we were still at war with Russia, with the communists. And there was fear that the communists were going to gain a foothold in Lebanon. And whoever controls Lebanon controls the Middle East and so on and so forth. And to this very day, we're still engaged in conflict mm -hmm. in the Middle East. Yeah. Our history is about the Middle East. Yeah. Lebanon is very near and dear to my heart because that's where I became a Zionist, was in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. You see, 30 days after the invasion of Lebanon, I was born. Because God sent me on a mission. And 17 years after I was born, I was in Lebanon on the front lines of what we were getting ready to annihilate Lebanon. And so my first duty overseas was to build bombs that we dropped on Lebanon because we were bombing Lebanon. You see, what happened in 1975, there was a civil war in Lebanon. And tensions were escalating to such a degree that I got a call from the president, Gerald Ford. We need you. Send me. Now everybody's looking at me. I had just got called to preach. Matter of oh. fact, I had just preached my first sermon two weeks before I decided to enlist in the United States Navy. I was 16. I decided to enlist in the United States Navy rather than to pursue my call to preach. There's a lot of reasons for that. But here's the thing. The crisis in Lebanon didn't begin three weeks ago, a year ago. It's been going on for decades. So you see, <clears throat> I tried to join the Navy when I was 16 and I was told to come back after. You finished high school. I said, I'm not going to waste my time in high school. I have something to do. You see, I wanted to go and be with the Sixth Fleet because the United States Naval Sixth Fleet is the fleet that goes to the land that is Israel. When it pulls into port, it goes into the port of Haifa, 
And in Israel, they love the United States Naval Six Fleet. <laughs> and what way to get to the land but on board a combatant ship and pull into port where everybody loves you. And that's all I looked forward to was getting into Haifa. But it never happened. Because there was a conflict that broke out in Lebanon in 75, and my ship that I would eventually left on the day that I began to train in San Diego. I went through 14 weeks of training. Then I was shipped overseas. I landed in Madrid, Spain, and I proceeded to meet up with the Sixth <coughs> Fleet in the Eastern Mediterranean, right off the coast of Lebanon. And I had the privilege of flying from Sicily, Italy, all the way off the coast of Lebanon, but before we got on board that plane with a whole lot of us that were being shipped over, we were being briefed that we could be shot down by missile fire. That's when it became real. So you're telling me that we could die out here? Yeah. Missiles? launched by an enemy at American transport planes that landing on those carriers. And sure enough, that was my introduction to the Lebanon conflict. And for the next 62 days, we were preparing for war. 62 days at sea. And every day, we had work to do. And my job was to assemble the bombs, hoist them onto pallets. They go up top deck, they're loaded onto our bombers, and they're dropped in Lebanon. So why were we bombing Lebanon? And this was in the crisis of 1976. I just gave away my age. I was born at you. 75. Well, I see, when you were being born, God was already preparing me. <laughs> for duty over there. Amen. <laughs> and every night we built bombs, thousands of bombs. And we bombed and we bombed and we bombed and we bombed and we bombed. The question is who was the enemy? None other than the Palestinians. The P L O. weeks on board that ship, I was sold out for Israel and its right to the land. There was a fire that ignited in my heart that this is a just war. And what we're doing in Lebanon is justified because, you see, we're there in defense of God's holy nation, Israel. Now, I became so pro-Israel, <coughs> pro-Zionist, that I got the attention of my superiors. Because something happened one afternoon. I got into an argument with a fellowship mate who badmouthed Israel and the Jewish people. And those of you who know me, <laughs> I can get pretty argumentative, and I have matured. I don't fight with fists anymore, but I definitely threw a punch at that shipman. His name was Abar, something Arab, and he was pro-Palestinian. And we're wearing the same uniform, but everything came out that day. And if it wasn't that they restrained us, we would have gone to blows, because he was talking bad about Israel. And he was talking about my enthusiasm to want to blow up the Palestinians in Lebanon. 
You have to understand, when you're 17 years old, you want to fight. If you're not ready to fight in war, you don't have the right to put on that uniform, whichever military service you're in. This young man was an Arab. And this young man was bad-mouthing Israel and the Jewish people day after day as we're building bombs. And so what they did was reassign us to the nuclear weapons department. And our job now was to walk the nuclear warhead every day because they're going to drop it on Lebanon. Now I can say this because 40 years has passed and this is public information. Every day a nuclear warhead was hoisted up deck and put on a bomber and we were waiting for orders from the president to drop the nuclear warhead on Beirut. <laughs> if we had done it, Israel wouldn't have to fight Hezbollah today. Mm. Wow. You see, if you don't finish it, it's like cutting the weeds, weed whacking them. You know what's going to happen? They're going to keep coming back. The only way you get rid of the weeds is you uproot them. And behind him was a Marine with an M16 pointed to his head. Oh, MG. The reason why is because if he decided he... to sabotage the launch, oh. they would kill him instantly. Oh, Imagine that. Imagine that. How is it possible that you can wear the same uniform and be on opposite sides? Was he American? Was he, he, he was. He, he was. He had to been to be in the service, right? He was an Arab from the Middle East that had enlisted in the United States Navy. By identity theft, or I, I don't kind know. of. All I know, he was Ali. Yeah. He was Islamic, mm -hmm. and he was a Palestinian sympathizer who didn't believe that Israel had a right to the land. Listen. That's where it starts. Read it in the Bible. <laughs> I was a good Baptist preacher back then. It's in the Bible. Whose land that is? God gave it to Israel, to the Jewish people. Is that is that the, like the original like where the remember where is it Abraham his Abraham's two sons where God gave the promise to the firstborn, but the uh, yeah, that's a name? different story. It, but isn't that's it what like, happens when we don't wait on God and we try to come up with a solution on our own? And Sarah did. And but but isn't it where they're right now today where they're fighting for the, the land right there? Like of course, that's where because you have the descendants of Ishmael and yeah. you have the descendants of Isaac. The entire Arab world yeah. believes they have the right to the land because the firstborn of Abraham was Ishmael. Yeah. Yeah, and Isaac, I mean, and Isaac stole the birthright. Sorry. Stole the birthright. Yeah. And so on and so forth and so on and so forth. And so the argument that really almost went to blows was simply this. He's reading from the Quran, and I'm reading from the Torah, right here. He goes, the Jews wrote that, and it's full of lies. Here's where you're going to get the truth. Now there's two different books, two different spins on the story. But when you have God, and you have the Spirit of God in you, the Spirit of God will not lead you in the way of error. Amen. Jesus said that the Spirit will guide you into all truth. And the Spirit of God will reveal to you things to come. Mm. 
And I will tell you that what I experienced in the Middle East at 17 was a prophetic vision of Israel invading Lebanon in the latter days that would engulf the entire world into World War. Today, that's what we are on the verge on, of a global war. It all hinges on what Israel will do in Lebanon. And why does Israel need to get into Lebanon? To uproot Hezbollah. Because even if you have victory in Gaza, as long as you've got Hezbollah, you're going to continue to have conflict. And Israel will not realize peace until that issue is resolved. <coughs> so, we had an ambassador in Lebanon. First name was Francis. In 1975, that's where he was at. And while we were there, there was a lot of activity going on. Why? Because we're getting ready for a nuclear strike. That's the way we're going to resolve the conflict. Sixty-two is waiting for a war that did not happen. And thank God it did not. On the day that we got released from the Eastern Med and made our way back to the Western Mediterranean, to our home port in Naples, Italy, it was June 16, 1976. And do you want to know what happened? The Palestinians killed our ambassador and two other people with him. He was on a mission of peace. But a terrorist is not interested in peace. So to negotiate with a terrorist organization is not very wise. So whatever fallacy or fantasy this government has, that somehow you can come up with a peaceful solution to a conflict that has been going on for thousands of years? Because it comes to one question, whose land is this? Is it the land of the Palestinians or is it the land of Israel? Israel. Israel. And you see, we can wear the same uniform as Christians in churches all over the world. But you want to know what the debate is? Which side do you stand on? Mm -hmm. Are you with the Palestinians or are you with Israel? Israel. What side do you think Jesus would stand on? Israel. Israel. There you go. He said it. It doesn't take rocket science to come to that conclusion. Are you for us or are you for our enemies? There is a historical account that we're going to read about this morning in Joshua when he had an encounter with the commander of the armies of the and you read about it in Joshua. And you remember, Joshua is the general that led the armies of Israel in the conquest of the land because there was a generation of Laodiceans who refused to fight. Every generation produces lukewarm Laodiceans, mm -hmm. and Israel was not exempt. The first generation of Israelites that were supposed to go in and take that land by force, you know what they did? They refused to fight. They would not engage the enemy in combat, and therefore they retreated, and they wanted to go back where? Egypt. Egypt. And God was not pleased with that generation because of their unbelief, because they simply did not trust God, who had promised them to give them the victory over their enemy. See, there's nothing new under the sun. War is not new. War goes back <laughs> from the very beginning. There must have been some war going on between God and Satan before man even was on the earth. Yeah. Because we read about 
the earth was desolate. Somehow, whatever existed before Adam, there had to have been some cataclysmic chaos on earth that brought about its demise. We read about God destroying the earth by water, but now he will in these latter days destroy it by fire. And I believe that fire is a nuclear holocaust, hmm. which the world is on the verge of experiencing. And because I had the, the privilege of babysitting a nuclear warhead, and that's literally what we had to do. Because you see, if it fell, I'm supposed to put out, I had a fire hose, I was at the head, and my job was to pull that so the phone could, because what happens if it fell on the hard deck? No, 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 no. Pastor Gill wouldn't be here today, and then it would be Rochelle preaching. God spared me then, and he spares me now. But there is coming a time when that will not be so. So Joshua had an encounter with Jesus. Now, I say that that is Jesus because in chapter 5 of Joshua, hallelujah, we all know Joshua, be strong and be what? Courageous. courageous. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. Why? For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go, even in Lebanon or anywhere else. How many believe that God is with us today? Oh, yeah. Emmanuel. That's, that's in our name. Emmanuel means God with us. And God with us, Israel, that's why we cherish the name that God gave us. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Who came up with that name? <sighs> General Rod Zinn. Many years ago, when we came into agreement that we would join our churches together and plant a new messianic congregation, and he named it Emmanuel Israel, and it is our name to this day. That was back in the days when we had peace on campus. Well, thank you, because now I have somewhere to attend. <laughs> uh, Emmanuel Israel? Isn't it? Is that this? Wait, is what's his name? We're yeah, that's what. Yeah, that's what. It's just a fellowship. It's named here. Yeah, that's what I. Yeah, meant. we're based here now. Yeah. Well. Many people. Well, how come you're not over there? Well, that's a different story. <laughs> like I said, not everybody that wears the Christian uniform is on the same side with Israel. <laughs> we were both U.S. naval personnel, but one was <clears throat> pro-Palestinian, the other was pro-Israel. He called me a Zionist, and I don't even want to mention what I called him. <laughs> but I can tell you, it was not peaceful. <laughs> it was words that can provoke. Okay. But Rochelle's looking at me, you have to tell the whole story. Tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I called his God a pig. I didn't know you can get in trouble by referring to Allah as a pig. You're a pig God. Isn't it a rock? I don't know. The only rock I know is Jesus. What I'm trying to tell you is, it's a war between two gods. The God of the Jew, the God of Israel, and that other God that pretends to be, this is his holy site. It's the same? They, 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 wait, our temple? That's a little cheap. Wait a minute. I will be first to tell you their God is not our God. The owl. The owl. But how come they say that they, they okay, because my daughter in laws They say a lot of things. She's, she's but saying, you're here to hear the truth. Remember, the Holy Spirit is not with them. The Holy Spirit is with who? The Jews and the Christians. There you go. So you can't tell me that if you're on the side of the Antichrist and his armies, right? How come she says, okay, so I just have a question, Pastor. Because she said her... her because we have a hard time praying <laughs> together. But she said that their God is the God of Abraham. She Allah? said that to me. Allah is the God of Abraham? That, well, that's what my daughter-in-law said. I know that, I don't know, I don't know about okay, but that. Here, that let me, let me but I know that I know here. the God of Israel. We worship the God of Israel. Israel. 
We are a Judeo-Christian organization. There is an alliance between the two sides. We are pro-Israel, we are pro-Zionist, and we apologize not to anybody who thinks we shouldn't be taking this stand with Israel and the Jewish people. Okay? Yes. So I'm not here to whatever it says. We love unconditionally. I've learned a lot from those days when I was a teen. We were all young. We were all, we want to fight. I kept dreaming. That warhead falling and there would be no Lebanon today. And the one that would be gone would be Arafat and all the PLO. But if you let them take root, they're going to grow. They're going to get stronger. And guess what? One day they're going to turn on you. America needs to wake up to what's happening in our country. Do you remember December 2nd of 2015? What happened? 14 people here were killed by Islamic terrorists in San Bernardino, California. Okay? Laodicea, if you don't wake up one day, your church is going to be what? Annihilated from within. Okay? There's a reason why the Lord does not want us to be lukewarm. Because lukewarm people are complacent people. They'll sleep in the daytime when they should be watching. And in the military, God forbid, that you should be caught sleeping on watch. You watch. Joshua is the kind of warrior we pray God will raise up in this ministry. The Joshua's, the Caleb's, the Deborah's, the warriors. Why? The ones that are not afraid to fight. Because the other ones will be the first to take flight. Right? They'll abandon their post because they don't want to see war. They don't want to suffer persecution. They don't want to have anything to do with a tribulation. Those are the ones that enlisted in the Lord's army for the benefits. But they don't want the duties and responsibilities of serving in the Lord's army. How many soldiers of the Lord do we have today? Come on, every hand should be up. Come on, people. Ain't no higher than here. <laughs> and so, in Joshua chapter 5, something had to happen. We have to set things in order before the armies of the Lord can begin to march into the land and possess it. What the first generation of Israelites did not do, the new generation would rise up and get the job done. And they would be led by none other than who? Hey, I mean Joshua. Joshua, who is a foreshadow of who? Yes. Yeshua, Yeshua himself. Matter of fact, what does Joshua's name mean? Yes, Savior. Savior. Oh, Savior. Savior. God saves. And the God of Israel who saved Israel then is the God of Israel who will save Israel today. So here's my question. Who's leading the armies of the Lord on earth today? Is he? Well, you know where he's leading us from? The front? At the right hand of the throne of the Father. Does he know what's going on on earth right now? Yeah. Is he concerned about you and me and all of us? Yes. Did he not say, I will not leave you orphans? I will come to you? He said to wait, to tarry in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. In other words, wait for the gift of God, the promise of God. You know what that promise is? The Holy Spirit in you. How many has the Holy Spirit in you? Amen. Right here. And God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but of power and Amen. of love and a Amen. sound mind. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You see, how can a Christian who claims to have faith in Jesus cower out of the battle? and refuse to stand with the land and the very people God calls his chosen people. Mm. 
Now Joshua had a responsibility to get things right. There's a new generation of Israelites, and there is a problem. Verse 1 tells us, so it was when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of San Bernardino. <laughs> See, we have to get out of the west side before we can take the north side, the south side, the east side, and every other side. God raised me up on the west side of San Bernardino. And even does say west. It does say west. <laughs> and so it is. And all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we cross over because they heard it on CNN. They got the news reports that God is with the Israelites. And what happened at the Red Sea? The armies of Egypt were decimated. Does Egypt have a history? with the Israelites. Does Egypt have a history with Israel today? Yes, yes. Yes! Yes. How many Christians are here today? How many read their Bible? I read How many Bible. know biblical history? That should be everybody here. I don't exactly know, but I want to know. I'm learn. learning. Stick around, because you're going to learn a lot of history here. Let me tell you why it's important to know history. Because those who... Those who fail to what? Learn no. from history are doomed to repeat it. Does, does the Bible the says the, really our lack of, lack of... It's a fair to people. Absolutely. And so it is. They heard that the, the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we had crossed over. Until they had crossed over what? Jordan. And what did God do at the river banks of the Jordan? He dried it up. But that didn't happen until the priest set foot in the waters. You see, the leadership, the spiritual leadership of the people have to be the ones to take the first step. And then God will perform the miracle. If we refuse to take that first step, don't be dismayed when you see no miracle. No wonder working power of God because God's power does not work in a lukewarm church. You got a lot of philosophy, you got a lot of humanistic logic and reasoning, but you don't have the anointed Remember that. You see, those priests that had the chutzpah to step foot in those waters and God would perform what he did at the Sea of Reeds. He did it again at the banks of the Jordan River. And news spreads very rapidly. The fact that we have in Israel today is a miracle. How could you have so many nations bent on your destruction and yet you still are there triumphant, victorious? Because the God of Israel never sleeps nor Amen. slumbers. Amen. He doesn't grow weary. He will fulfill the oath that he swore to the fathers, that he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he gave to Israel as an everlasting covenant to be God to Israel and to the Jewish people forever. So it is a forever covenant that God has made with his people Israel. And the Israel of God today is the Israel of God we read about in the Holy Scriptures. And the people that who are Jews today are the people who are descendants of the Jews going all the way back to which generation, Rochelle? Third and all the way back. So if you have Jewish heritage, you're reading about your history in these pages. Amen. And so it was. They heard. 
And you see, and we crossed over that their heart melted. Their heart melted. Why? Because when the people see that God is with you, they're terrified of you. When the world is not terrified of the Christian church, there's something wrong with the church. When the church is moving in the power of the Spirit of God, the world trembles. Amen. That's power. You see, you have received the spirit of power and love in a son. Amen. Amen. Christians have the power that Israel needs for it to be triumphant and victorious. And who is the head of the church? None other than Yeshua yes, himself. So I cannot imagine Jesus sitting on his throne in heaven and his church, the body on earth, boots on the ground, refusing to fight for the very land and for the very people that he came to save. A church that does not stand with Israel cannot tell me they're standing with the Lord. It contradicts everything we read about in the covenant that God made with Israel and with the Jewish people. If it is true that Jesus is the Messiah of the Jewish people, then where's the church standing with Israel and the Jewish people? Where? Think about that. Pray about it. Because we need more pastors to have that blindness removed from their eye and that heart that melts, they're afraid to stand with Israel for fear of retaliation by a world that hates Israel. And so their heart melted. And there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. You see, when the Lord is with you, and when the Lord is moving triumphantly in and through his people, the world is terrified of God's people. But the world is not terrified of the Christian church because the Christian church has no power. <clears throat> Paul prophesied that in the latter days there would be a form of godliness in the church, but it would lack the power. Yep. What you have are philosophers with, with the doctrines of men, with the traditions of men, who have turned on the very people God calls his chosen people. Call it for what it is. Amen. And those hirelings will see the wolf coming and, run. and they'll run. Mm -hmm. And they'll close the doors of the church to the Jewish people. Don't you come in here. We're living in those days, church. We're living in those times. And Joshua now has a mission to fulfill. He's been waiting 40 years to carry out this mission. He was ready 40 years prior. He and Caleb, among the 12 spies that were sent in, there was only two. Pastor Gil and Rochelle. <laughs> and the other pastor says, no, we won't go. I'll take that one. <laughs> They said we had to be crazy. You got me behind you. I'll back you. Right. There you go. See? In other words, what we're saying is it's not a popular stand. And it's not going to gain you favor inside the churches. And that's why we have to meet in residence like this to do what we do. Because we're not welcome anymore in many churches. Why is it like that? 
Don't we say, serve the same Lord? Are we not all brothers and sisters in Christ? We wear the same uniform. We read the same Bible. But we're on opposite sides. Takes me all the way back to the early days on board that ship with that Arab sailor who just wouldn't stand with Israel and the Jewish people. And had set us at odds with one another. And where we're ready to go to blows with each other. Because we were on two opposite sides. He called Abraham father. Well, Abraham is the father of all who walk in the footsteps of the faith he had before he was circumcised. Yeah. And I don't read about God promising Abraham to give the land to the Ishmaelites. Mm. Show me. Mm. So they're fighting for you something can't. that's not that's not theirs. Not war. But I do read about the warnings to those who will divide the land. Mm -hmm. The three women. But they do. So I myself. Okay. Because my son went over there to Jordan because that's where my daughter-in-law says she's from. Okay, but she's really from... Okay, so... But my son recorded it because I told him, Ooh, go if you're going to the Jordan River, bring me some, some water from where Yeshua was baptized, right? Well, on their side, he was on their side, right? Do you know that they... I watched this in the video. It's on my... Whoever has my Facebook, I don't know if anybody does, but which I probably shouldn't have one, but you could see them. They won't even look there. Their heads are face downward. As soon as they, you get near there, they won't, they won't even face that way. And it's on their side, that area, supposedly. Um, the, where, well, the site where Yeshua was baptized, but I'm not sure if it's really true, but I mean, it, it, they, it's stated that. So anyway, I um, <laughs> told my son to get water, but they won't even like face there. They won't look there. They, you could see them just, they're not. You're not. They're not allowed to like turn face, turn their faces towards that area. Isn't that amazing? They won't even walk. You and you could see it. You could see their faces. They're not, they don't even seem like happy. Like happy hearted. <laughs> like their their soul. Their clothes are like like dingy colored. Like in there, you could see everything about it. Yes. You see, that's what fear will do. <laughs> and you see, when you have fear in you, you're too fearful. You're too afraid. To mention Israel and the Jewish people in your church, you won't even pray for Israel and the Jewish people because you're terrified of the retaliation that would come your way. It would make you very unpopular and might even cost you your job as a pastor because the congregation doesn't want to hear it. But that's why we're not hirelings. We don't work for the church. It, it, it's pretty simple. We're, we're not employees of the church. We, we won't be because we're not going to be mandated for or against. We took a stand and we haven't looked back. When we declared our allegiance to Israel and the Jewish people, and that's the direction our ministry is going, you either are for us or against us. And that's when things began to divide. It's sad that it'll divide the church on the issue of Israel and the Jewish people. So, no different than it was in Joshua's day. Why? How do I know that? Because <laughs> at that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives for yourself and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. Does Israel need another circumcision? It is called the circumcision of the heart. And it's not done with hands. The only one that can circumcise the heart is God himself in the person of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And you and I can pray for our Jewish brothers and sisters that God do just that. Yeah. Because if God can melt the hearts of the enemies of Israel, he definitely can embolden the hearts of his own people by circumcising them. And why is it so important that their hearts be circumcised? Because the heart of a Jew, even though he may outwardly pretend 
or be religious doesn't necessarily mean that he has a heart after God's own. And the same is true of Christians. Just because they profess Jesus, their heart can be far away from the Lord. And that's a tragedy. And so Joshua, being instructed by God what to do before he advances into the land, before he begins to take on the enemies that are in possession of the land, before he would dispossess them, their heart had to be right with God. They had to be obedient to what thus saith the Lord. And why was it important for that generation that was uncircumcised to be circumcised? What is the significance of that, Rochelle? Because it is in the Torah that every male Jew must be circumcised. And if you're going to experience God's blessing, God's grace upon your life, it ain't going to come through a life of disobedience. If you don't believe me, study Jewish history. When God says, do, do. When God says, do not do, don't do it. And so, Joshua did what God commanded him to do. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt who were males, all the men of war. Are we talking about the military veterans here? Men of war. You know what we need in the church? Men of war. Amen. Mighty men of valor who are not afraid to take a stand. All the men of war, the Bible says, that came out of Egypt, all of them had died in the wilderness on the way after they had came out of Egypt. And I'm going to ask the question, why would God bring them out of Egypt with an outstretched hand and then turn around and their bodies would fall in the wilderness and they would never lay hold of the promise? Was it because they were obedient? It was because of their disobedience. Yeah. Obedience brings the blessings and the promises of God into your life, disobedience will cost you the blessings and the promises that God has made to you. It is better to obey because rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. See? And God will deal with the rebels among his people. And so what was their what did they do? They were men of war who refused to fight Israel's war. And I believe many pastors are going to be come under judgment because they refuse to fight. Because they are cowardly, unbelieving, and they're going the same way as these first generation that came out of Egypt. Okay? So now... They died along the way after they had come out. For all the people who came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the wilderness on the way they had come out of Egypt had not been circumcised. What happened, Rochelle, to that newborn generation? Were they not religious Jews anymore? Something changed along the way. They began to assimilate into what? The mixed company that was around them. You see, God's people are a holy people. And when they begin to adapt to the ways and the customs of the nations around them, why is it important for us to be separate? Come out from among them and be what? Separate. separate. Lest you share in their plagues. Lest you get absorbed their idolatrous ways. You can't fool God. Evil company corrupt good habits. Exactly. If you surround yourself with people who are not 
serving the Lord, do you think that's going to do you? No. You imitate the five people that you surround yourself with. So if you're around haters of Jews and anti-Semitic Christians, what do you think will eventually happen to you? You'll begin to adopt anti-Semitism and replacement theology, and you'll be fully persuaded that the Jew has been replaced by the Christian. And therefore, Israel has no right to that land. That's sad. Matter of fact, it's horrific. That would be like Jews marching with the Palestinian protesters calling for death to Israel. Thank God we don't have Jews marching with or do we? There are some. Wow. Jeez. So, keep in mind, for the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness to all the people who were men of war, who came out of Egypt, were consumed because they did not obey the voice of the Lord to whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord had sworn to their fathers that he would give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. Then Joshua circumcised their sons whom he had raised up in their place, for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. So you see, God is able to raise up a new generation of Israelites even in these troublesome times. And I can tell you and testify to you that God is raising up a new generation of Israelites who are circumcised of heart, who are filled with the Holy Spirit, who are in churches and who are in synagogues and who are stationed like ambassadors all over the world, who put their lives at risk every day. And these are the heralds of good news to Israel and the Jewish people. These are the ones who speak comfort to Israel. These are the ones who encourage and edify and exhort Israel Amen. to be strong and to have faith in their God even in the midst of trial and tribulation and persecution. Because you see, when it's all said and done, endurance is key to your success. Examples of enduring leaders is Joshua and Caleb. See, they could have also gone the way of all the others, but they did not. They dared take a stand that was contrary to the masses of people who were chanting, let us get back to the land that is Egypt so at least we can be civil servants again, slaves of Pharaoh again, See, it's not God's way. And so you see the consequences of their disobedience. And so it was that he finished. And now the children of Israel, as it is written, camped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at twilight on the plains of Jericho. What are they doing at the banks of the Jericho? Worshiping. What are they doing? They're getting ready for their first battle. And you want to know what they're celebrating? The Passover. I was right then. Hallelujah. They are circumcised and they are observant Jews once again. And so, and they ate of the produce of the land on the day after the Passover unleavened bread and parched grain and on the very first very same day what happened the manna. the manna ceased on that day after they had eaten the produce of the land and the children of Israel no longer had manna but they had ate the food of the land of Canaan that year if you're going to want to eat the food of the land it's not going to be by continuing to have uncircumcised hearts and to continue in your rebellion and disobedience against God. God is for the land. He stands with the land and he will continue 
for the Jewish people to possess that land until it's all done. Until he fulfills the oath that he swore to the fathers. See, God is not a covenant breaker. Our God is faithful. What he began, he will finish. You see? And so, God is able to mount the hearts of the enemies of Israel, and he's able to embolden and circumcise the heart of the new generation that's going to get it done. Amen? Pastor, can I, is, that, is that a good case or a bad case? Jordan? Can, or, uh, or it says in here, Canaan. Or how do you say? Uh, yeah. Canaan? Yeah. Come on. Jordan and then Jericho. Not the land of Israel. It was the name that was given to that land before Israel went down. And the borders so of that land is, goes a lot further than what they're fighting for right now. But it's good, right? Amen. <laughs> Okay. And so, and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and he looked and behold, there was who? Come on now. What? Who shows up? You see, what, what, what Joshua saw was a man. But that man is no ordinary man. Do you want to know who that man is? Yeshua. So I'm going to ask you a question. How Jewish was Joshua that day? He just got done what? Observing the Passover, which God commanded the Jewish people to observe. He also carried out the circumcision that had not been done on the new generation of Jews that were born in the wilderness and during the wilderness years. And guess what? The manna stops. Because the manna was a testing to see what's in their heart, whether they would obey God's voice or not. The test was over. It's time to get on and take that land. You see, understand, the trial is going to continue and the testing is going to be prolonged until you do what? Cross that river. You cross over. <laughs> you understand? Step in the water. Stop playing with God over here on this side of the Jordan. Cross over. Get to the other side. Because there's a mission to fulfill, and that is for Israel to possess the land. Amen. Now you see, when a Jewish person sees you coming, they don't see God. Mm. What they see, they see a man. They see a woman. If you're wearing a cross, what do they think of you? You're a Christian. You come and you say, I'm a Christian. Do you know what the Jewish person is going to do? He's going to respond the way Joshua responded. He doesn't know you from Adam. He doesn't know if you're with the Jewish people or you're with the enemy of the Jewish people. And so it is. Joshua. He sees a man. He doesn't know that it's God. He doesn't know that it is Yeshua. He doesn't know that this is the Messiah that had been promised. He didn't know that. And so, what does he do? He asks, he asks are you for us or for the adversary? Exactly. Because this man had a sword drawn. There you go. You want to know the sword of the Christian? the word of God. Mm. And when see a Christian comes to a Jew and starts throwing the word of God at them. Mm. Boom. Are you do you believe in the Bible? Remember the woman that attacked me? Mm. <laughs> what? Really? What? I got attacked by a Christian woman <laughs> who said she saw that we were Jews mm. and she, she had a Bible that must have weighed 10 tons. And she came, and she I saw her coming at me. By that time. I saw her coming at me, and she got that. I thought she was going to throw it in my face. Do you believe in the Bible? Yep. 
start. <clears throat> Amen. I said, of course, I'm a Baptist preacher. <laughs> a Baptist? <laughs> Wait, you were a Baptist preacher? <clears throat> That's what she said. Yeah. <laughs> what? A Baptist preacher who is with the Jews. <laughs> How can you be a Baptist preacher and, and, and look like a Jew? <laughs> you mean she said what I just said? <laughs> you know what they call us? Crazy cults. <laughs> Judaizers. Oh, I know that. Because I bet you, you, you talk about circumcision, you probably keep the Shabbat, you probably do all those Jewish things. That's in the Ten Commandments. Exactly. I mean. It is incumbent upon every Jew to be <laughs> obedient to what thus saith the Lord. Amen. Okay? So any Christian leader that is going to try to cause a Jew to stumble mm. and to break the commandments of God cannot be a friend of God. You see, Jesus said it would be better <clears throat> that they put a chain around your neck with a big concrete block and throw you into the Jordan River and you die than you cause one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble. So I'm going to say, before you start throwing that Bible in my face and judging me because I'm Jewish, who believes in Yeshua, be careful. Mm. Because I can guarantee you, God will deal with you. Okay? You're not exempt from God's promise to the Jewish people. I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Because there's a lot of Christians right now who are no better than the Amorites and the Moabites that refused to help the Jewish people. Mm. And so, sword drawn, this is a man, Joshua doesn't know the difference. What he sees is a man with a sword drawn. Is this a friend or an adversary? Mm -hmm. or an adversary? Do you stand with us or with our enemies? Isn't that the question that Joshua asked that day? You see? And Joshua said to him, <clears throat> Are you for us or for our adversaries? You see, he said, no, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? Amen. Amen. When Jesus shows up in the person of a man or woman who is a believer of Jesus, that person has the Holy Spirit in them. Mm -hmm. And you and I, like Yeshua that day, we stand ready with our swords drawn to fight alongside the armies of Israel mm -hmm. all the way until the land is fully free and God fulfills his promise. So see, when Israel's getting ready to go to war, Jesus isn't sitting idle and neither is his faithful church sitting idle. The only church I read about that is idle and lukewarm is that church of Laodicea that was warned that you better have a change of heart and attitude. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I will come quickly with my sword drawn, and I will do what? Mm -hmm. I'm coming after you. And that warning was to the Christian church. Yeah. And I think a lot of churches today need to get it right. So what is the problem? Why wouldn't we stand with Israel and the Jewish people today? What's in the heart? Is it hatred? Nine times out of ten, the people that are replacement theologists are anti-Semitic in heart. Their heart is so hatred 
of the Jewish people that they're hoping that the Jews will die in another Holocaust. And they want them to be uprooted and eradicated from the land. They're cheering on the enemies that want to destroy Israel. So today, here we are, the men of Israel. Amen. Soldiers Amen. in the Lord's army. Amen. And who is the commander of the armies of the Lord? <laughs> Yeshua. Yes. And like our commander, we go into this battle with swords Amen. drawn. And that's the warrior that we are praying for. God raise up in this ministry who are ready Amen. to fight. Amen. Appreciate it.